classical Christian education has come a long way. Countless folks, well, I can't count them anyways, have worked extremely hard over the last generation to repair the ruins. And there's a lot to be grateful for. Christian educators have made great strides in integrating the Bible with various academic disciplines, recognizing that all truth is God's truth and that therefore somehow related. God's creation, for example, is a universe, a unified whole, whole despite its diverse contents. And we now have genuine hope for building a Christian worldview in the coming generations. There is, however, one important area where we've not quite been able to put things together, and that's mathematics. For one thing, we still teach it like the rest of America, but not necessarily like the rest of the world. And I'll say a bit about this in a moment. Perhaps more importantly, we've not yet figured out how to integrate mathematics with the rest of the curriculum with history, philosophy, theology. Sure, we know that mathematics reflects God's orderly nature, and good for us. It's a crucial truth, despite how difficult it is to flesh out the details. But we no longer see the real importance of mathematics to the broader Western culture, particularly to philosophy, nor do we see the strong influence of philosophy on mathematics or the influence of both on science and vice versa. Math, philosophy, and science grew up together, and only recently have we tried to separate them. This is particularly unfortunate given the intellectual and cultural battles that we must deal with today. It would be no exaggeration to say that science is one of the major cultural forces today which subtly but powerfully shapes our view of reality, including the kinds of things we believe are possible and impossible. Of course, this is why atheists today have more apparent force than ever. They offer plausible sounding arguments for the claim that science shows that there's no God, or at least that science hasn't found God and that we therefore have no evidence for his existence. Christians have good reasons to be skeptical about these claims, but often their rebuttals are misplaced. We often try to beat secular science scientists at their own game, playing science by their rules. Even many creation scientists fall into this trap. One of the main solutions to all this is a course or two in the philosophy of science, and in particular, the integrated history of philosophy, science, and mathematics. Only then will we be able to root out the main fallacies of atheistic arguments. In fact, learning this integrated history, along with its timeless lessons, is necessary for an adequate understanding of philosophy itself. And without understanding philosophy, there is no classical education, Christian or otherwise. Of course, without knowing how to do math, we're not going to get very far in understanding its significant place in the history of ideas. This isn't an either or, it's a both and. We need to learn how to do math and learn how it fits into the broader Western intellectual tradition. Now you might find yourself thinking at this point, look, we already spend a lot of time on mathematics. There's no way we can add to the workload. My response is twofold. First, we need not add to the workload, but need instead to teach math more effectively. Second, learning the historical, philosophical, and theological significance of mathematics will take place mostly at the high school level and above when students are able to grasp more abstract concepts and fit them together into a coherent picture. Now that's not to say that there's nothing that can be done in the earlier years, but for now our attention is on students that are, who are older. Also, and perhaps this is the third response, we can't afford to ask how we could possibly cover anything more than doing problems, as natural as that question is. To say this is akin to asking, is to say this is akin to saying that we're too busy driving to get gas. 
One of the goals of this book, in addition to teaching calculus classically, is to give both teachers and students an example of how mathematics can be taught from a classical and Christian perspective. That is, I want to show how I think mathematics education can be improved rather than merely tell you. First, I'll say a few things about calculus in particular. Anyone of average intellectual horsepower and a very basic understanding of algebra can learn the fundamentals of calculus. So why is it that only about 14% of our high school students study calculus? Why is calculus seen as a luxury, a delicacy appreciated only by mathematical connoisseurs? For two, two reasons mainly. One, we're not motivated enough to teach it. We have no idea how central calculus is to Western inter intellectual culture. As one teacher helpfully put it, calculus is the mathematical counterpart to the works of Shakespeare. Having a basic grasp of calculus, including why it was invented, puts a lot of Western philosophy and science in perspective. In fact, calculus is an ideal place for those involved in classical education to begin teaching mathematics classically which is why I think this book will be so helpful for us at this stage in the game. The only other bit of mathematics that, ha that has had as much impact on the humanities or liberal arts is Euclid's elements. If calculus is akin, akin to Hamlet, Euclid is like unto Homer's Odyssey. Until our students learn the fundamentals of calculus and Euclid's elements, they'll never integrate mathematics with the rest of their studies, and they'll never really understand the whole. Now, the second reason calculus is considered a luxury is that it just seems too hard for students who aren't exceptional at math. But it's not too hard. I've taken liberal arts students who visibly blanch at the mention of mathematics students who are by no means math people, and in eight weeks taught them real calculus, derivatives, integrals, limits, and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Moreover, they understood the central meanings and purposes of these concepts, and they're delighted. Never did they dream that they'd be doing calculus, much less in so short a time. The problem isn't the fundamentals of, that the fundamentals of calculus are too difficult for the average student. Rather, the problem is that we make it difficult. Not that calculus doesn't require work, but we make it far harder than it has to be by covering too many topics too quickly. Many topics which are unnecessary at that stage of the student's learning. More isn't always better, and in the case of mathematics, it can cripple the student. The Natural, National Science Foundation sees this more is better approach as the primary reason for America's current math debacle. In testimony before the House Committee on Science, NSF Director Dr. Rita, Col Rita Caldwell says, U.S. textbooks contain many more topics than those in other countries. For example, the science textbooks we give to our eighth graders cover some 67 topics. In Germany, they cover nine topics. As the saying goes, we are learning less and less about more and more. Now, as a result, the slower students feel like failures and the students who are hardwired for math never fully flourish, but are all the while congratulating themselves on their mere ability to follow mathematical recipes. An avalanche of concepts makes calculus unnecessarily complicated, masking its overall structure and even its very point. But simply spending more time on fewer concepts isn't enough of a change. Too much, too fast isn't the only cause of difficulty. Another cause is covering the right concepts 
but at the wrong time. In fact, there are concepts that be, sh should be left out altogether until the core of the discipline is mastered. All concepts aren't created equal. This is a general principle for teaching anything. Until a basketball player can dribble the ball in his or her sleep, he or she won't be ready for complicated plays. The, the alternative to all this, of course, is to teach only the right concepts at just the right time. But deciding which concepts to include and when isn't at all easy. It requires familiarity with how mathematics is actually used in the advanced sciences and in industry, as well as knowledge of the subject's historical development, including the overall importance of the individual concepts to that development. It also takes a healthy knowledge of philosophy and of how science, math, and philosophy are a cord of three strands. We shouldn't be surprised at this difficulty. Again, we're in the repairing the ruins stage of academic reform, which means that there's a lot of work to do. Yet it also means that we're on the steep part of the learning curve, and so there's potential to reap significant rewards relatively quickly. This is the one sense in which we may have it easier than subsequent generations. Our yield promises to be extremely high. And this book, as I said, is an example of what I have in mind.